Hi, welcome to this talk, which is mostly about work in progress. It's KDE CI in or on FreeBSD. Uh, this is joint work by myself and Scarlett Gately Clark. Uh, I used to be a software quality researcher. Nowadays, I work uh, for the audiology uh, people here in Utrecht. Um, Scarlett has, is a KDE hacker uh, based in Arizona nowadays, and she does all kinds of containerization and packaging work uh, supported by Blue Systems. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about KDE, although I imagine most of you know at least it's the blue stuff, as opposed to the brown stuff, which is GNOME. Um, KDE is, is a very large, nowadays a label for a very large community of developers, contributors, uh, that build and create KDE software. Um, we also use the same name to refer to all the software that this community creates. This is a bit confusing sometimes because people tend to talk about KDE 4, which was in fact a software pro product released by the community, and then there's this thing KDE 5, which doesn't exist. Um, because that's not a software product that the KDE community releases. See, things get a little confusing with naming. But then again, Microsoft calls completely different products the same thing all the time. So, why can't we? Uh, KDE is 20 years old uh, last month, and um, so we, we, we can almost drink in some U.S. states. Um, so the current pro software products that the KDE community releases are called KDE Frameworks 5. Um, frameworks are a set of 70 uh, little libraries that build on top of the Qt library. Yeah, I'm, Mr. Cameraman, I'm going to keep walking back. No, I'm fine, I'm fine. Um, it's 70 libraries built on top of Qt uh, that add all kinds of little things missing from Qt. Uh, they're intended to be lightweight, easy to integrate into any Qt application. So Qt applications using KDE frameworks is a perfectly normal thing to encounter. KDE also produces the Plasma desktop, which is the desktop shell, what, you would, what us old school folks would call the desktop environment. Uh, that's the stuff that puts your window manager on the screen, puts your launch menu, and all that kind of stuff. And KDE also produces a whole bunch of applications, uh, ranging from best-in-class uh, painting applications like Krita, uh, video editors like KDE and Live, um, through to stuff that is interesting, but um, you know, we, there's a Japanese language trainer, which I think is kind of cool, uh, but not something I have ever personally wanted to use. Um, KDE software when it was announced 20 years ago, it was announced as the cross-platform desktop. It was, you know, there was this up-and-coming stuff. Linux was kind of, kind of interesting. Um, so Matthias Etrich said, hey, we should build a one desktop environment that runs all over the place, that fulfills most of our users' needs, and just uses one toolkit. <coughs> uh, so it was originally intended to be very cross-platform. So it runs on uh, the Linuxes, all the different flavors you can imagine. It runs on Unixes, uh, FreeBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD. Um, it ran until two, three years ago. Uh, it ran on Solaris as well. Um, and then OpenSolaris shut down, and I couldn't get a Solaris instance running anymore. So. Kind of stop there. Uh, it also runs on Windows and Mac OS X, or whatever it's called nowadays. Um, obviously, not all of the software makes sense on all of those platforms. There's no point in putting a desktop on Windows. It already has one. Um, so frameworks are useful on Windows. The applications are useful on Windows, but Plasma isn't. Uh, roughly the same thing applies to Mac OS. So, there's a whole pile of software, and I'd say 99% of the developers of KDE 
are working on Linux. Uh, some, play, you know, I guess a lot of them are, are in um, Debian and Ubuntu. There's a fair pile of them on OpenSUSE. There's uh, some Fedora folks, and then you know, there's there's sort of this small corner of developers running other systems. Um, so we've got this original plan of run everywhere, and then we've got a developer base that is fairly heavily skewed. Um, Qt, at the same time, should run everywhere. That's one of their, it was one of their marketing slogans. Code once, run, every, run everywhere. Um, <coughs> it does run everywhere. It runs on Linux, and it runs on Windows, and it runs on Mac OS. And they kind of forgot about the BSDs. Um, the FreeBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD are not tier one platforms for Qt anymore. We keep it running anyway. Um, because it's, it's close enough, and except for horrible things like um, Web Engine, which is basically Chromium, uh, things work really well. Anyway, so we have this little mismatch between what our developers are doing and what we're trying to run on, which is, uh, and then multiply that by the amount of software that is being written. We've got those 70 frameworks. Um, the, the Plasma desktop bits are another 47. Uh, Git repositories, right? It's, it's all very modular, very split up. Um, so we have um, 1,200 total repositories. I won't lay claim that that is a very scientifically accurate count of different applications, but um, you know, that's a reasonable idea of, of how much, how many different software bits we've got to run across those five, six platforms that I named earlier. So. We've got a lot of software that is being written, and then what? We've, it ought to be tested. Distros do that, but distros test what's been released. So, you know, you, you look at the, the OpenSUSE build service, it builds whatever is, has been released. Um, there's recently, um, KDE Neon is a Ubuntu-based distribution uh, which basically packages up as, an Ubuntu, as a full Ubuntu uh, derivative. Um, <coughs> yeah, Git Master, or the, whatever is its most recent. So it's, it's a snapshot build. OpenSUSE has, has the same uh, with Argon that builds the most recent KDE development snapshots on OpenSUSE's most recent. So, to some extent, distros are doing, uh, are doing the testing and integration as well. At this, on the other hand, they're not as close to the, the source code as they ought to be, or they could be. So there's a, there's a gap there in CI. Um, so basically, we say, okay, KDE as a software community is a building software, we ought to test it, and we ought to test it on, this, on all the platforms that we claim our stuff ought to run. So if we say it ought to run on FreeBSD, then we're, we best actually get that running as soon as we can. Um, well, CI uh, is, has three main challenges. Uh, somebody has to sit down and do it. Now, KDE is uh, almost entirely a volunteer community. Um, and that means that you have to find a volunteer to run the CI, um, or at least set it up once. And, you know, you, it's always a problem. You can find volunteers for the fun bits, and it's a lot harder to find volunteers for the tedious stuff. Um, this is one of those, those criticisms also leveled at open source software in general is that you know, the fun stuff gets done, and the tedious stuff doesn't. So anyway, fortunately we have Scarlet, and Scarlet has said, I'm going to do the tedious stuff, which I think is great. I mean, she's, she, yeah, yeah she, really picks, the, she picks that kind of stuff up and uh, sits down and gets it work. We have a, a technology, technological challenge, uh, which is to actually get it running and working across the different platforms we're on. And then eventually we're going to have a social challenge of getting it 
used because um, you know you've got these developers on Linux and you have to get them to watch something else um, in order to fix their software in ways fix their software for platforms that they're really not interested in. Um, and we had the, I, I, I created something called the English Breakfast Network long ago. That's a source code quality checking platform. Uh, the reason it's called the English Breakfast Network is because I register domain names when drunk and you know you end up with weird domain names. Um, but the English Breakfast Network basically is a whole collection of C++ code quality checking tools <coughs> that run on the KDE code base uh, continuous cycle and they spew out reports. And I kept plugging that for a couple of years saying hey we should watch this stuff look it's signaling all of these important uh, code quality issues in KDE code, we should fix that. And that, you know, took, took a while, but it eventually got accepted. We've got the same kind of social challenge with uh, CI for FreeBSD, is uh, simply getting people to, to watch over it. Um, one of the additional technological challenges is that we, KDE is a big stack. Um, you know, I've, there's plenty of people here who will say, I don't run it because it's so heavy. I'll run LXDE, which is going to be LXQt. Hey, you know what? LXQt <coughs> depends on KDE frameworks. I think that's kind of amusing. But that's because the KDE frameworks are small, lightweight, modular libraries built on top of Qt. Um, anyway, so we've got this, this gigantic stack that we uh, need to have in order to uh, build and run uh, KDE. Um, and we're targeting uh, Linux, FreeBSD, Windows, Mac OS, oh yeah, and Android as well. Uh, recently, um, a number of uh, KDE applications have decided, hey, we should be on Android 2. Um, because they're good applications and they can be useful there as well. Uh, but that adds another complication in the mix. Um, <coughs> Things we're concerned about are our current releases with upcoming Qt, because uh, the Qt Corporation is reasonably good with uh, keeping their backwards compatibility, but you know, sometimes it breaks <coughs> they introduce Chromium. Um, so we've, we've got a, a whole bunch of things that need checking. So eventually we're going to have to build this giant matrix of of builds to see that everything is still working. So far, I'm, I'm hardly saying, telling you anything interesting about CI. I mean, this is general CI or something. Um, but we're going to be building on different Linuxes. And the Linuxes have agreed amongst themselves that they're not going to call packages consistently, name packages consistently. And of course, FreeBSD doesn't name things the same as any of the Linuxes either. So, um, we you know, will go out of our way to make a difference. And then sometimes we change all of the names as well. Yes. KDE, <coughs> the KDE packaging on FreeBSD just renamed uh, just about everything. Um, in order to finally make it consistent, but yeah, to achieve consistency, you still have to break right. a few eggs. And so one of the, the Three steps to actually getting any of this CI running, any of this CI working, is that we have to figure out how are we going to name, how are we going to deal with dependencies, um, because you really don't want to keep up with the naming conventions from FreeBSD and from OpenSUSE and from uh, Debian uh, to deal with this. Um, so once we've defined, some, once we've written down some kind of uh, dependency tree and, and define what we're going to be depending on, uh, then we can use that. And what, we're going to, what we will end up doing is uh, depend on a well-defined base system which has all the other stuff installed, the GNOME bits that, that get used by KDE, the GPG, uh, the databases. Um, that's all going to be in there. And then we're going to build the rest in CI. That sounds an awful lot like Flatpak or like Docker, which, well, which also work with a well-defined base system. So uh, on some systems, 
we will be using uh, Docker, and when we're building uh, when we're building other stuff, uh, it'll resemble Slack a little more. It will resemble Slack. So KDE uses Jenkins as the central tool. Um, that's the driver for all of this uh, CI work. Um, what we put on top of Jenkins is a uh, sort of a meta job. It's, it's called KDE Generate Jobs or something like that. Um, what it, it's a groovy job that reads a whole pile of configuration files and generates more jobs for itself. Um, so every now and then, we push the big red button on this meta job, and it will go through and collect up all of the, the KDE repositories that need building and all of the variations that we've defined as interesting, and it will generate new jobs um, uh, in that Jenkins instance. Right? That's what you can do with Jen with, with Groovy. As you can, you can mess around with everything inside your Jenkins. Uh, so that's what we do. We create new jobs and leave them lying around. Um, this Groovy program, you know, Groovy is, is often um, promoted as a, a nice way of writing domain-specific languages. You can, you can uh, use its uh, special method calling um, syntax to write down nice sentences. You know, you, you could conceivably say, build framework, blah, blah, in FreeBSD, and that would make me a sensible Groovy program. Um, we don't actually do that. It's, it's a program that looks a lot more Java-y <coughs> Java than that it looks Groovy. Um, it reads in a whole bunch of uh, YAML files, which describe the projects we have and their dependencies, and then it uses that to spit out uh, the remaining jobs. So, what happens is we start with a bunch of YAML files which define the projects we have and the dependencies. Those get eaten by the meta job, which spits out uh, smaller jobs, uh, a huge number of smaller jobs. Those smaller jobs invoke job-specific glue, and the job-specific glue largely depends on the target platforms and target variations that are going to be used. Those eat more job-specific configuration, and then in the end, it does the actual build. Uh, why do we have so many different configuration points? Um, it's because we the, the configuration at the at the start is defining what kind of platforms, what kind of targets we have, and the configuration along the way is uh, more the the build specific configuration for each target platform. This remains an issue. Um, or, you know, there's just too, there's enough variation between FreeBSD and Windows that you actually have different, uh, <coughs> different configure command for the one and for the other. You know, it, it happens. Um, you don't have auto tools everywhere. So sometimes you have to use something else. Good thing you don't have auto tools. Um, so the, that's that's why there's multiple configuration points in there. Um, I'll show you a little bit of the yeah configuration file format. What are we what are we looking at? Um, or how do we, what do, how do we write this stuff down to find to, and we're going to start with the metadata. The YAML metadata that drives the platform selection, the platform creation. Um, that's just just a bit of YAML, um, but it works like this. Uh, we define a group. For instance, frameworks is one of the groups of, of software artifacts that we have. Um, one group can have one or more branch groups. Uh, Kind of regret reusing the word group in there, um, but a branch group uh, names a whole bunch of 
names one or more uh, variations. Uh, for instance, we can have a branch group called KF5 Q5, um, which happens to be the branch group for uh, following KDE Frameworks 5 on the latest uh, Qt5 version. There's also a, a KF5 Qt5 stable branch group um, that says uh, we want Frameworks 5 and the defined as stable long term the LTS release of Qt, which is 5.6, because the most recent release is 5.8. So there's variations in that sense. And um, a branch group then follows particular tracks, and the track then maps to a name of uh, a Git branch eventually. So what we're, what we're doing here is, is kind of stacking a whole bunch of, of variations to say in the end, when we build the framework called Attica in group KF5 Qt5, we really mean that Git repository over there and branch master. And with a, nut, with a different selection, we end up on the same, probably the same Git repo, but the branch 16.10 uh, uh, for a, a previous release. So, um, yeah, this, this mechanism uh, sort of drives the, the labeling and collection of all of our CI jobs so that in the end you can say, well, give me everything that, was, that is building the, the new stuff. That's branch group KF5, KF5. Um, within a project, then we we also have more variations in terms of target platforms. Here we've got a <coughs> platform called Linux and it has a compiler called GCC. And then you see again tracks something. That's going to match with the uh, what the branch groups uh, in on the previous bunch uh, mentioned. So, so devel, once you match devel and devel, then you've got a viable combination. Um, another <coughs> platform would, is defined as FreeBSD Clang, which is a sensible uh, thing. There's, there's more variations possible. I mean, we could conceivably do FreeBSD GCC, um, but that would be weird. Uh, more sensible would be Linux Clang, um, but again, that, that's gonna, that just enters a world of hurt. Um, <laughs> Just, <coughs> just dealing with your C libraries and, and all the other dependencies. So, in practice, one platform means one compiler. Um, but the, the option is there to do other things. You know, and I, I used to do Solaris with compilers GCC and Sun Studio. So, at some point, we had, you know, long before any of this CI stuff came in, but we used to actually run multiple compilers against the code base on the same platform. And that was when Sun Studio was a really good C++ compiler, and GCC wasn't. And uh, we, we had a, a great deal of benefit from the kind of bugs that, that Sun Studio pulled out. Um, okay, so yeah, platforms have one or more compilers, and then in the end, we get a bunch of, of labels. Uh, so you can you can talk about frameworks KF5, Q5, Linux, GCC as a, as a viable platform. Then we move to another side. The other side is per software artifact that we create. Uh, what does it make sense to build this stuff for? Because, like I said earlier, Plasma doesn't make any sense on Windows, so we're not going to even bother building it there. Um, so here's the name of a framework, a window system. Um, it takes most of its settings from the defaults, which is those things that I mentioned earlier. And then per platform, uh, it's going to name some labels that it needs to match. It only makes sense to build this on Linux GCC tracking develop. Um, and a little farther down in the file, it now says FreeBSD claim uh, develop, also as a sensible thing to build for. 
Uh, then there's variations, just just in case we uh, hadn't didn't hadn't run out of space in keeping track of how many builds we're doing. Um, you can apparently build the window system without X, um, which means Wayland, right? Everyone knows that if you don't have X, you've got Wayland. Um, so that's that's just another uh, one of these variations. After all of this variability, what does this give us in the end in, in Jenkins? So once it's, I, I see our Australian has fallen asleep, so I could switch to Dutch. <laughs> um, yeah, after all, of those, after all of those variations, it actually comes down to less variation than you might think. Uh, simply because a lot of the, the variations are incompatible in any sense. Um, so here's a, a look at uh, sort of the, the, the top bit, alphabetically the top bit of our Jenkins. It's, trying, it's going to try to build Attica, which is one of the frameworks, um, on Android ARM GCC, and it's going to do it in Flatpak, and it's going to do it in FreeBSD and Linux and OS X and Windows with Visual Studio 2015. <coughs> Uh, the gray ones have never actually been built uh, since we reset this Jenkins instance. So, um, you know, not everything gets uh, all of the, doesn't get all the attention yet that it needs. You know, these, these should be running more automatically. The Linux stuff does run automatically. The FreeBSD stuff we're in the process of, of getting. Um, yeah, so that's. You know, then once you've got all those variations, uh, it generates all of the jobs. And then we get to the point where you're going to be picking up the build configuration, right? So far, so far we haven't we haven't actually gotten very far so, yet. Um, sorry, I'm not using lots of words and not getting very far, but that's sort of the feeling you get when doing CI. You spend lots and lots of time setting stuff up. Um, all of these labels drive the reading of configuration files, uh, which are used for the actual build. So we've got specific configurations to apply when doing KF5Q5. Uh, we've got specific stuff for FreeBSD. We've got specific stuff for Clang. What kind of specific stuff is that? Uh, because we haven't used, God, this, this just opens us up to so many criticisms for, uh, we're going to use another file format for this configuration, okay? <laughs> okay. Just because. Um, it, it wouldn't be IDE if we didn't have lots of different configuration options, right? Um, <coughs> so we're going to use an any style uh, thing to actually define the, the characteristics or the configurations for the actual tool. Uh, so this is going to tell us that, that we're uh, that we're using Clang, where the stuff lives on the actual build hosts, um, and yeah, this, this is one of those things. Linux, Linux users always think that make is GNU make. So <laughs> and that shell is bash. And, and shell is bash, and uh, <laughs> and aux, aux is bison, that kind of that kind of stuff. So that's why we have a configuration saying yeah, make is we mean user local bin for gmail. Um, some stuff on, particularly on FreeBSD, gets uh, removed or at least been trued out. Uh, there is no GCOV that I could find on FreeBSD. There's uh, there, there's some tooling for the kernel using GCOV, but not for general applications. So. You know, our, that particular part of the quality check uh, is being just is elided on FreeBSD. You know, I figure that the unit tests on Linux are going to have roughly the same coverage as the ones on FreeBSD. So uh, I, I, I can live with that for now. But if you want to make GCOV, I have no clue what it is. So it is some kind of coverage tool. Yeah. Love Obviously, <laughs> Love the G says something like GNU, I guess. <laughs> it does, it does. 
you know, it talks about a huge amount of variability on the, on the, on the front end, and then that reads in uh, configuration files depending on labels that are generated for the actual jobs. Um, and then surprisingly, it all comes back down to one Python script, right? We've, we've used, we've only used two programming languages so far, Groovy and Java, and shell script. And YAML? YAML isn't a programming language, wow. it's a configuration file format. So we've got two languages and two file formats so far. <laughs> no, we, we, ha we haven't actually written any C++ for this. Um, I don't think we really want to do that. Uh, because if we were to do that, then we'd have to start distributing those C++ tools. You get another layer of stuff. Anyway, the actual build is done largely by Python uh, script, which picks up again all of the uh, is passed in all of the configuration options that have shown up uh, elsewhere. And Jenkins uh, environment injection. Uh, throws in all of the stuff that is de derived from the different build step configuration files. And then the actual build tool um, spins up whatever is needed to, to do the actual build. And the build steps, uh, they sync up all of the Git repos, which are checked out on the uh, on the build nodes because um, you know all those th there, there's multiple scripts being run in the course of the build so we want those to be up to date. Um, then it rsyncs all of the dependencies that don't live on the build node itself. Um, it fetches those from another machine. And this is actually why I want it to be in room one right now because that's where uh, we're being told that rsync is way too slow and we should be using ZFS instead. Well, obviously, for FreeBSD, that's the right thing, to, that would be the right thing to do, right? So, in the end, I'm going to have a to-do slide and it says, watch that talk and then do ZFS uh, synchronization instead. Um, why are we rsyncing instead of installing things? Um, that's because a lot of our the, the software products we produce uh, have a fairly intricate inside KDE dependency path already. So the frameworks can depend on one another, and our applications obviously depend on a whole lot of the frameworks. So this is stuff that we've just built. Um, and so we're going to, that's why we pick them up off of our own rsync instead of uh, out of packages. Then we run the actual build. Now, you know, that's for KDE application or KDE software, that's CMake, make. Um, and CMake has, it is pretty good at dealing with whatever environment it's in. So this, you know, you don't have to configure a whole lot about CMake to tell it that uh, user local is the right place to go as opposed to user. Um, the build script runs all of the tests that it can. Um, at that point, lots of tests fall over because there's no X server on the, uh, the build nodes. Um, then there's the QA steps, uh, which is where I showed you GCOV would conceivably run, CPP check runs. Uh, there's, there's a whole suite of tools that look at um, the resulting binaries to, to say some, or the build logs as well. Uh, and then the results, the actual build, the stuff that comes out of the build is rsynced back to uh, our rsync host so that you know any other nodes can pick up what was just built. Those are the steps that we go through. Um, on Linux, uh, we use the Jenkins Swarm plugin so that it spits out a whole bunch of uh, Docker images, or it uses Docker to spin up a whole bunch of of instances and, and build everything in parallel. Um, with FreeBSD, we're still looking at what is the right solution there, whether we can use the, the, the Jenkins stuff. Um, there is Docker on FreeBSD. It makes strong use of CFS um, to, to handle, it, handle the instances. So that's uh, something we should be looking at, uh, except right now, 
our build hosts are fairly limited. So, uh, in the sense of uh, the FreeBSD builder is a virtual box running on my desktop now, uh, which is just not quite enough. Uh, Windows and Mac, we have a single physical machine somewhere that is being used. Um, this is this is simply a consequence of being a largely volunteer-driven uh, project. Um, you know, we've got to look around and scrounge up uh, some hardware to do the actual builds. Um, FreeBSD does, does a couple of things differently from the Linux builds. The Linux builds, um, they build everything from Qt on up. And on FreeBSD, um, we install Qt and a whole bunch of Qt-based dependencies uh, already on the build node. Uh, the reason for doing that is that building Qt is actually fairly complicated on, uh, on FreeBSD. There's a, f there's a lot of patches needed. Um, so if we, want, if we really wanted to, to sit down and do that, yeah, you build Qt again. But we have other, other groups building Qt regularly anyway. So you know, it's a trade-off between how much do we want to build within, with the KDE CI and how much do we want to let other people deal with. Um, so on the FreeBSD side, we install more than uh, on the Linux <coughs> side. Um, and then we trick, trick the CI system by leaving a whole bunch of empty directories around uh, for it to rsync with. Uh, so what does it look like on the FreeBSD side uh, now that we've got everything running? Um, it's, it's, it's kind of nice, you know, this one sticks out like the bo dog's bollocks. It's, it's a big red ball. Um, we, we can actually say, hey, this is, this is bad. Um, the gray, here's one gray ball. Uh, blue Z doesn't make any sense on FreeBSD. It's a, a, a Bluetooth system, subsystem that is far too Linux entangled uh, to be useful on FreeBSD. Uh, if we were to actually uh, drill down into that blue, uh, the, that red ball, um, yeah, it turns out that the programmers are using something and forgetting that um, user local include is a thing. Um, so our, our CI system actually track does signal in one of the basic frameworks, hey, here's stuff that you should be watching, or this is stuff you should fix. That's when we get back to the social aspect of getting them to actually fix it. Uh, but we're working on it. Uh, so here's our, our future bits. Um, like I said earlier, we need to figure out the, the docker and the swarming so that we can um, spin up more uh, instances um, simply to speed up builds and so that we can expand our coverage. Right now, it only the FreeBSD CI covers uh, the frameworks, that's the first 70 libraries, uh, but that leaves us with 1130 more things that need building, and that's not going to fit on my desktop. Um, we need to uh, deal with rsync um, and try to speed that up. Uh, the code base is, in principle, uh, not all that KDE tied, right? We've got that big meta job reading configuration files and spitting out build jobs, and the build jobs reading configuration files based on their labels, none of that is really KDE specific. So any other project that has a huge number of software repositories plus a huge number of variations that it needs to build could, can, could use that. Um, increasing the accessibility of the code base means that uh, it needs more documentation and we actually need to sit down and Make, it, make the code look pretty. Um, and it would be really useful if we could, now that we've got FreeBSD down, right, Mac OS, X, Mac OS X is sort of the next, the next door neighbor, right? We, you start with, from a Linux developer point of view, you've got Linux, and then you've got FreeBSD is, is kind of like Linux, and then you've got Mac OS is sort of another step farther, and you, so that's, what, that's our next automation target, is uh, getting Mac OS one. And that's when I hit space one time too many. Other questions? Because we've got minus two minutes for that. 
<laughs> Otherwise, you can uh, bother me elsewhere. Well, well good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Real stroke off of this. What are these? What?